Welcome to the Energy Central Power Perspectives, a podcast where based on member readership, we interview the most popular and engaging topics found on Energy Central. The Power Perspectives podcast connects you to contributing members who have submitted thought-provoking content. I'm your host, Jason Price of West Monroe Partners and Energy Central's Community Ambassador based in New York City. I'm joined by my colleague in Orlando, Matt Chester, producer and community manager for Energy Central. Hi, Matt. Hi, Jason. Uh, Great to be speaking with you again for another week and to already be at our fifth episode of the Energy Central Power Perspectives podcast. You know, each of the the topics and guests we've had thus far has been so unique and spread across the spectrum of the utility industry. It's it's been really fun to explore these varying parts of the business and what they mean. And I know we're getting into another new topic uh, for the podcast, and it's one that's of increasing importance to the industry. So I'm excited to see what comes from this conversation. Likewise, since 1995, Energy Central has been a trusted news and information source for for professionals working in the power industry. Today, Energy Central is more than just a news source. Energy Central is a network of community groups focused on specific topics in the industry. Our managed communities are a place where professionals like you can come together to share, learn, and connect in a collaborative environment. We invite you to become a member, if you haven't already, and join 200,000 other professionals working in the power industry. To join, visit www.energycentral.com, and membership is free. We experience technology in every facet of our lives, both personally and professionally. Technology makes us more informed and possibly wiser, especially when planning big decisions. An often overlooked and rapidly advancing area of technology is moving from singular data sets and area maps, including old school cartography, to far more sophisticated, integrated, and interactive modeling called geospatial technology. For example, city planners utilize geospatial to predict population growth on neighborhoods and demand on water resources, or the influence of rising tides and changing weather when planning new roadways, a tunnel, or high-speed rail. As you can suspect where this is going, The technology raises the bar on how we can plan, prepare, and mitigate in a time of climate change. This is what is known as geospatial technology, applying a range of modern tools contributing to the geographic mapping and analysis of the Earth with human societies. By combining aggregated data sets with geographic and visualization capabilities provides planners and researchers an ability to model future outcomes on society based on decisions made today. As varied as human activity, geospatial technology is used by energy developers and utility networks, transportation hubs, agricultural practices, government programs, public safety and national security, risk management, wildlife preservation, water reclamation, mining activities, housing, development projects, and so much more. Almost everything humans do can be understood based on where something is located and how it is connected, and the field of geospatial technology is rapidly growing. Today, we will take you on a roller coaster discussing the good, the bad, and the ugly of geospatial technology. We will discuss the extent and limitations that the technology brings us and explore its applications further in areas of energy planning and management and something as unpredictable as climate change. Joining me to discuss this complex and evolving field is Linda Stevens, co-founder and CEO of 51 by 1, a business planning and marketing firm based in Northern California. Linda spent 16 years at ESRI as the CMO and working extensively on mapping, location analytics, geospatial, and GIS markets. Linda is a recent member of Energy Central and has already amassed some 7,000 views of her work and her three posts and comments. Linda, welcome to Power Perspectives. Good morning, and thank you guys for inviting me to this. Um, I love to talk about my favorite topic, geospatial, and I think it's a very exciting time for where the technology has been and where it's heading. So thank you. Absolutely, and we're glad to have you. Linda, you have a varied and impressive background in the geospatial domain. You were the CMO of Essary before 51 by 1. How did you fall into the area of geospatial technology and lead you to where you are today? Well, um, it goes back a long time. I was actually, I'm actually a geographer. Um, 
I got my degree at UCLA and um, over the summer um, while I was getting my um, graduate degree, I started working for a small little company in Redlands, California, which um, happens to be where I grew up. So I went home for the summer to live with my parents and I got a job at ESRI. That was back in 1986 and there was about 100 people there and just started working mainly. I I started out as a prototyping programmer, um, really started pushing the technology into new markets. And one of those markets that we that I focused on was the um, energy industry, specifically electric and gas and telco and did some of the early prototyping work on uh, modeling utility networks and automating maps and all of that and got involved in the community was a board member of AMFM and we actually that uh, changed into GEDA we rebranded the organization back then and um, now sort of um, as we grew Esri and created almost 60 industries we were going after by the time I left a few years ago and it's really been my passion like I said even before I discovered GIS or geospatial I was just uh, enthralled by how Spatial is such an important component of, of how we look at problems and how we solve problems. And it's becoming even a greater need today, like you mentioned, with climate change and the, the changes that are going to be uh, occur because of that. Tell us where you are today with 51 by 1 and how geospatial technology plays a role in your business. Well, um, I started 51 by 1 with a colleague of mine, and we really focus on Um, helping organizations that are focused in the geospatial markets. I help them grow, you know, where the best markets, where the technology should lead, really driving and promoting their, you know, capabilities. We also do a lot of uh, marketing consulting, you know, basic uh, marketing, but also integrating both GIS and geospatial into our marketing efforts. So, you know, targeting the best marketing efforts based on where people live and demographics of that location and the changes that are occurring in the in the populations and area and where to best locate stores or consulting businesses or whatever. So um, location is important in almost all all aspects of what an organization does. And we sort of bring that expertise to play. Geospatial technology is driven in large part with data. Share with us your basically your perspective in terms of how has this technology been used in perhaps unfavorable ways or in unintended consequences? Well, you know, I think that like any technology or any skill set, it can be used for good or bad. And I, I know that sounds kind of basic and, 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 and silly at some level, but it's true, right? So, you know, um, governments are using GIS and geospatial around the world. And so they're using it to help their citizens or helping to, to better allocate resources, but at the same time, it can be used to allocate resources to their advantage, political advantage, or economic advantage. So it's like any technology. I think what's more of a problem, and I think it's becoming a problem at a faster rate, is the, the misuse of geospatial technology because people don't understand the uniqueness of geospatial. So people are taking data and applying it to problems that it really shouldn't be applied to based on you know, its accuracy or how old it is, or, or even using data sets together that aren't even in same, the same projection, for example, or, you know, building a, a data, a geospatial data set for one use, for example, like remaking maps, right, in utilities, a lot of the early, and even today, a lot of the data that's out there and a lot of the technology out there is really used to automate the mapping process. But when you try to use that for something for analysis or analytics, it also often gets bogged down and, and, and isn't useful. So I think people are siloing their uses within ge- geospatial, and I think that, that that's actually causing a lot more problems than it's helping. So I think that's a bigger problem than it's being misused. I think it's um, in an unfavorable way. I think it's just being misused because people don't understand what they're doing with the data and with the analytics. Linda, when, when it comes to energy companies and utilities specifically, mm-hmm. can you comment on where sort of on the pathway that sector is with GIS in terms of mm-hmm. are, is the utility sector leading in, in the use mm-hmm. of geospatial? Are they playing catch up? And especially the, in, in what you just mentioned in terms of proper use versus misuse, mm-hmm. does, does the energy mm-hmm. industry tend to fall one way or the other? 
Yeah, it's interesting. I think you see industries go, are cyclical and their use of geospatial utilities, um, you know, were some of the early adopters for geospatial even back in the 80s with, um, in the 70s with IBM had some network modeling, um, you know, SCADA systems are, are some early examples of, of using geospatial technology and they sort of drove and they continue to drive innovation because they they do they do need geospatial technology. They're geocentric in what they do. They manage assets that are in locations that are connected and they need to understand that. So in the 80s and 90s and the early 2000s, utilities were really driving it. And I think you're seeing now sort of that next wave because one of the things that's really affected in a positive way is utilities, the ability to to access geospatial data in quickly and inexpensively. So satellite data, LIDAR data, sensor data is becoming more available with IoT, for example. So you're seeing a lot of ability to have a lot of data, but now geospatial technology has to catch up again because it's not really designed to manage large data sets that, you know, that are coming in real time. The, you know, sort of the, the basic geospatial technology GIS is, was really designed to manage data entry, getting the, the, the utility networks into the systems, managing those as built, um, to helping the designers design better, better systems. But now it's trying, you know, we're trying to take it to the next step. I think what you're going to see is just a ton of innovations around that area. Being able to do geospatial um, analysis on big data sets in real time, being able to look at problems um, across time and space, so temporal, spatial temporal analysis, which really hasn't been able to be done very well in traditional GIS systems. So there's going to be a, a, an adjustment and a focus now away from just making and managing spatial networks or electrical networks into, you know, how do we manage this real time? So mobile first, how do we get data into the field quickly, out of the field? How do we model that stuff in real time? How do we bring sensors and spatial technology and analysis out into the field, into the edge computing uh, world? How do we put some firmware out on these sensors that can do real time, you know, smart analysis and do modeling and adjust the network in real time, as opposed to having, you know, the central office have to do modeling after the fact and decide how they're going to adjust a network, for example, during a fire, during the fire season or during a wind event. In the future, I think those things will just be done automatically as we start to integrate geospatial into the very, you know, network and pulse of the electrical uh, industry and into them making real digital twins. So I think that is going to be huge. And I think the utility industry is going to be pushing that and be on the cutting edge of that, like they have in the past with, the, with technology. Linda, the energy central community is pretty broad and vast. They cover, you know, the members cover a wide range of different disciplines and skill sets mm -hmm. in the energy space. Can you, can you think of any, uh, or can you describe some, perhaps some current events where we could all... You could describe the application of GIS uh, for the for for our audience who may not be so familiar with the uh, geospatial technology. Mm. Well, um, we can the one that's that comes to mind in, in in terms of the electrical network is the the recent fires in California. That that problem, when you think about it, traditionally, you know, has been we have you have your um, you know tree trimming crews, vegetation managements in one department. You have the distribution network folks in a different department, you have SCADA, transmission, all that in different departments, it's kind of siloed. And they each have, you know, automated their data, but, um, and they're maybe getting real-time data in, but it's not integrated integrated across the, the, the systems. So one of the powers of geospatial technology is to in integrate disparate data sets based on where they're located. So being able to take in data about, you know, risk areas, wind information, weather information, network data, as well as asset data from your ERP system, bringing all of that together to model, you know, where is the likely hot spots, where, where do I need to shut power off because of the wind event, um, where can I, when can I turn it back on, how do I notify the public, how do I manage all that, and then not only that, how do I replay that so that I can go and re, um, 
uh, reassess my vegetation management process so that I really am targeting those areas that are in the high risk areas with real detailed data, not just, you know, sort of high level information going in and being able to do um, strategic management of my network. All of that information is coming from a geospatial system. And how do I integrate the non-geospatial information into it to make it even smarter? That's a that's an example of where um, of where the industry is going to be heading. And you know you can apply that to anything. How do I integrate that information in with and help organize the response with first responders or insurance companies, right? So I want to be able to look at all this information at a very detailed level, but also be able to share it out and. Um, integrate my work and my responses with other agencies. And, you know, in, in a non-spatial system, that's almost impossible. It is impossible, actually. You need to have that geographic context to be able to apply to apply it to the, um, to the problem you're, you're looking to solve. So that's, you know, that's one example. There's lots of other examples, like where should I be um, looking at growing my network based on changes in electric car um, adoption? Where do I need charging stations? Where do, where do I want to put microgrids? What's the best way to manage the increase in solar panel and um, distributed um, energy production? So all of these things um, all have a geographic component. And at some level of, you know, geospatial technologies being used in little in little siloed application areas. The future is going to be about how does that all get integrated together in a way that we can better manage our our systems, um, especially with the changes in the climate and changes that are going to be happening quite rapidly. Well, let's move over to your um, your current place of employment, 51 by 1. Mm-hmm. You identify yourself as a business planning expert, a marketing a product expert, and yet you provide and include geospatial technology in your practice. Mm-hmm. So two questions. First, what is behind the name 51 by 1? And then second, share with us how you apply geospatial technology with your practice and the, the, the bridging of business planning and product marketing. Yeah, so um, we when we started the company, we wanted something unique. And, you know, there's, you know, geospatial and marketing there's just it's hard to come up with a a a new fresh kind of name around that so we started looking at using uh coordinates so 51 by 1 is basically a coordinate that's greatly reduced (laughs) but the original coordinate is basically uh, a location for a a site that we think is really innovative and kind of keeps changing its brand and that is stonehenge which sounds odd but it's um it's a it's a site that has changed what it means um, to locals, to the world, and it keeps getting rediscovered. People keep finding new things about it. And, and so we thought, you know, that brand keeps changing and growing, just like we want our customers' brands to be doing. So that's how we picked the name. It's a, it's a coordinate um, for Stonehenge. And then um, what we do is almost everything we do at 51 by 1 has a geospatial component. So we help startups and even larger companies look at their geospatial products and how they could can change the productization, what kind of products they could come up with, how those should be promoted and marketed. And and so it's not just it's it's looking at market markets also. So you know if we're if a customer of ours is going to come out with a product that supports surveyors, you know, where's the best location to do that and how should they target those markets because those Um, those groups vary across geographies. They have different needs. They have different rules, different regulations. So that's an example of where we would look at geospatial technology to figure out who and where to target, what kind of messaging we should apply, Um, but also what kind of products are needed in the market. So the, the needs might well, typically would vary based on the Midwest and United States versus in, you know, um, Prague. So how do we best um, help our customers understand those dynamics and how do you turn those different dynamics into uh, targeted marketing and sales campaigns, as well as, you know, what's the what are the next products that are going to be needed in this marketplace? So we do a lot of forward thinking, a lot of looking at where various technologies that maybe aren't associated with geospatial currently 
how those are going to be affecting the markets in the next year or so, and then how we can help our customers adjust and adapt to those changes. Linda, for, for businesses that may not have yet dived headfirst into the world of geospatial, you know, I imagine a lot of the inertia largely comes from maybe not understanding the technology or its its possible value to businesses. Mm-hmm. So again, bring it back to energy and utilities. You know, what's yeah. the best way to bridge that gap and and convey the message of, you know, the value that this can bring to any any companies that are still holding out or or haven't really explored the technology. Yeah, I think in the you know in the utility space, um, utilities by their very nature are geocentric. So they all have um, either used you know, they have paper maps and they've either converted those into CAD design or into some, you know, a GIS system. Uh, globally, those there's different, there's lots of different companies that offer geospatial technology for utilities. Um, I think that a lot of those have been to automate their the, the problems they had initially, which is, you know, making and updating paper maps. I think the challenge now, and I think it's a good challenge, is finding organizations out there and companies to build the next geospatial technology innovation for the utility industry. And there are companies out there working on that. You know, how do you bring those back office maps, you know, traditional just information out into the field? How do you integrate those together and how do you share that information in a way in real time? Those kinds of challenges, I think, will be, I think, young startups as well as existing large organizations are starting to try and, and figure out. And I think these are difficult. You know, utilities have been cutting edge because they have very difficult problems that need to be solved. You know, managing an electrical network that's changing in real time is not in, an easy thing to do. And so I think applying various technologies and thinking to the problem are, is going to be a very um, a, a big thing in the next, you know, one to five years. There's already companies that are kind of pushing that. And I think as more and more companies get into geospatial, they're going to find that the in, the industry, the utility industry, is a great market to target. So you're starting to see, you know, investors. So you're starting to see um, firms that um, VC firms and investors are now starting to go, hey, how can we apply geospatial to problems and what companies are doing that? Because we want to invest in this technology because we see it as a game changer um, across all industries. But there's a lot of these organizations that are just focused on the utility industry because that's, you know, a critical part of any infrastructure, um, government infrastructure or country infrastructure is having a solid, you know, utility system. So I think you're going to be seeing a lot of money and energy and and expertise applied to the problem. And I, so I think it's super exciting. I think people out there that know geospatial technology are hugely needed in the in, in this new in this new marketplace because a lot of these new startups don't have geospatial expertise. So one of my big passions is how do we how do we bring GIS professionals and connect them with these cutting edge companies so that we have that huge knowledge base that's been around for you know 20, 30 years. How do we take that knowledge base and apply it to some of the new technologies that are being invented as we speak? Linda, you are in a fascinating and ever evolving industry, and you're like you seem to be in the center of it all, which is amazing. <laughs> um, I, I want to give you the last word. Is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience before we um, conclude for the day? Well, I think um, I think it's worthwhile to, if you don't know about geo- geospatial technology, to read up on some of the innovations that are happening. Um, if you're into or really knowledgeable about, you know, related related topics like big data or IoT or digital twins, there's a geospatial component to all of that. So, you know, look at geospatial, but also look at where it is within the area of expertise that you're focused on and make sure that your organization is has an initiative to um, to look at how geospatial technology can be a holistic approach to managing and planning for your utility uh, future now and into the future. I think it's a it's a critical technology that everybody should be aware of. Well, on behalf of the entire Energy Central community, I want to thank you for taking time to share your knowledge and insight on this fascinating topic. You can read more and connect with Linda directly through EnergyCentral.com. I also want to thank our contributing partners of Energy Central, ESRI, 
the Environmental Systems Research Institute. ESRI is an international supplier of geographic information system software, web GIS, and geodatabase management applications. To Navigant Research, a premier market research and advisory firm covering the global energy transformation. To Oracle Utilities, providing best-in-class utilities management solutions to improve reliability, service, and safety for electric, water, and natural gas companies. To Atonix Digital, a Black & Veatch company. Atonix Digital software helps companies simplify asset performance and management by putting data to work to detect emerging risks, enhance efficiency, improve accuracy of planning, and provide an easily justifiable return on investment. And lastly, to Bentley Systems, a software development company that supports the professional needs of those responsible for creating and managing the world's infrastructure projects. Once again, I'm your host, Jason Price. Stay plugged into the discussion by hopping into the Energy Central community at energycentral.com. And see you next time at Energy Central Power Perspectives Podcast.